This episode is sponsored by Loot Crate. Link in the description and a coupon code to save 15% off on your subscription. Stick around to the end of the video to see an unboxing. It's what Blumhouse is made of, these generic cookie cutter horror movies. It's what Blumhouse is made of. It's what Blumhouse is made of. Look at that. They were so proud of this movie, they welded their name right into the title. You guys like my game day shirt? Sports were a thing that happened like a while ago. It was, there was like players and, and they had like, like scores and there was like a sports ball. It was wild. My tropical drink was supposed to have umbrellas with it, but apparently Total Wine doesn't sell umbrellas because that's a gimmick. I was going to put them all over Tiny Frank gradually throughout the video. Just know it was going to be hilarious, I promise. Welcome to the Mad Tea Party. If you're new to my channel, which I've noticed some of you are, this is the occasional video movie review of horror movies that I do. They're a little more lighthearted. It shows off my true humor. This is all 100% my snark and it's a little bit fun for me to do. Today we're talking about Fantasy Island, the American drama TV show from the late 70s? No, wait, that, that can't be right. Let's read the description. At a luxurious but remote tropical island resort, the enigmatic Mr. Rourke somehow makes the secret dreams of his well-heeled guests come true, although twists of fate occasionally turn those dreams into nightmares. In Blumhouse's Fantasy Island, the enigmatic Mr. Rourke makes the secret dreams of his lucky guests come true at a luxurious but remote tropical resort. But when the fantasies turn to nightmares, now it's the same exact thing. I'm sorry, we're going to move on. The film starts with a girl who consists of one color from head to toe, running for her life. She ends up in this office where she hides behind an open desk, where she explains on the phone how she's been abducted and taken here against her will. Ominous man on the phone, I can already tell, is the enigmatic Mr. Rourke, tells her, hey, LOL, I know, and two scary guys violently capture her by means of picking her up by the neck. I don't think I've ever seen anybody picked up that way off the floor. Then we cut to a lovely beach where a lovely lady is making a lovely callback to the original show. The plane. The plane. The plane. The plane. I don't know anything else about the original show. Maybe I should have watched it, but uh, you're not my boss and I can do whatever I want. Mr. Rourke is played by Michael Pena, who I think is a great actor. While I'm used to seeing him as a funny man, he actually is quite charming in this movie. A little lacking in personality, but maybe that's how the original Mr. Rourke was too. I don't know. I didn't watch it. Lands and off come the five lucky guests. They're all here because they won some contest. What contest? I don't know. Who cares? I'm sure it won't make any sense in the plot later anyway. This is Julia, Mr. Rourke's assistant. As they're escorted to the bar, this ominous fellow watches from afar. It would be a dream vacay without my baby bro, right? You know how you talk to your siblings. A lot of exposition at those family dinners. The guests all know the draw to the island, that all your fantasies will come true, and that's really all there is to it. This happens a lot to Julia, but I guess we'll find out why later. While hanging out in her cabin, Gwen is suddenly visited by the ghost of Blumhouse past, looking like a blackened chicken. Don't you worry, we'll see more of him later. Hey man, my brother's talking to you. That's me, I'm his brother, Wait, hello. You guys are actually brothers? Do you guys get that they're brothers yet? They're gonna tell you more times, I'm just curious. This is GD and Brax, and they're cartoon characters from an Adult Swim show. They're 32 and 38 years old, and they act like they're 18. This is Patrick. He also just has the one flavor of army boy. And Melanie, who's the worst. So, they talk about people on Reddit theorizing how the island does what it does, and it got me confused. Nobody online has gone to the island, and anybody who's gone disappears. You want to advertise the island, but wouldn't that get it shut down like yesterday? There's a lot more to this plot hole, and I'll get to it later. Let's move on. Let me officially welcome you to Fantasy Island. You're the best, Michael. Don't ever change. So the island has two rules. You have one fantasy, and you have to play out the fantasy to its natural end. Vague? You betcha. 
Well, my brother and I still don't have our rooms, so I hope the island is ready for a tough but fair Yelp review. You two are the Karens of the island. So the brothers, did I mention their brothers? My brother and I get to start their fantasy right away because they asked to have it all, which is a vague statement that's open to many interpretations. Their interpretations is chicks, drinks, whatever this is. They also keep mentioning that Brax has this nickname that he absolutely hates. Uh, I think if you know anything about Fantasy Island, it's that there's this guy named Tattoo who helps out Mr. Rourke. JD keeps calling him T, and they say that this nickname showed up because of some bad ink that he got. Are you getting what I'm putting down? Also, Brax is gay, which I think is very neat and diverse of you, Blum Blum. Thank you very much. But uh-oh, strolling into the party before vanishing was Blackened Chicken. Next morning, Gwen wakes up to this guy at the foot of her bed, and holy crap, that's as far from a fantasy as it gets, my guy. He tells her that Rourke needs her because she didn't fill out the fantasy question right. Too vague. When I want it all is not too vague, but this girl's I want a do-over is too complex for the island to figure out. Relationship? Single. Hey man, what the hell? Don't you judge me through the screen? So he wants to know what exactly she wants to do over, and we end up at the night that her ex proposed to her that she turned down once. She thinks that they flew him in, and it makes her sound completely crazy to the man. I don't speak to you for five years. Okay, when and where did you bump your head today? Moving on, we learn that Patrick's fantasy is to be a soldier, but he never enlisted because he promised his mom he wouldn't. Now how on earth can being a soldier go horribly wrong? Too easy, Patrick. Melanie, on the other hand, says that her fantasy is to get revenge on a childhood bully of hers. You're worried your fantasy sounds stupid. Just wait until you hear mine. Okay, so he tells Melanie her fantasy instructions. Go to an elevator inside and take it to the bottom. There she enters a control room with a glass cell with her bully Sloane inside. The monotone colored woman from the beginning, tied up and ready for revenge. Now, Sloane can't hear or see Melanie, who's convinced that this isn't real. She's standing in the room talking to herself, mentioning how she thinks Sloane is a hologram. Now remember that. Keep it in a safe spot in your head, because it might just ruin some plot later. The exposition in this scene, though. Wait, that's Sloane. Whoa, that is not her husband. That is her husband. Well, Melanie figures out, oh damn, this is real, I don't really want this, and decides to save Sloane. Meanwhile, Patrick is dropped off in the middle of the forest with some army clothes. I feel like... He didn't need to come to Fantasy Island to play out this fantasy. He's suddenly introduced to this character, who I believe we call Filler. He gets spooked away by some military who storm over and arrest Patrick, making his fantasy immediately not great. Back at the frat boys party. We boned. This guy's 38 years old. When suddenly their party is crashed by some men with guns. Oh, what's this? Well, it's explained that when you have it all, there's always going to be people out there who want to take it from you. Once a fantasy begins, you must see it through to its natural conclusion. Nobody knew what you meant by that! Did he? Did, did he get a hold of my script? What, what? 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 The girls now out into the forest trying to escape run into Lurch again, who... <laughs> roars at them? I've worked at a few haunted houses in my day. They don't have many rules, but two of them specifically are don't say boo and don't say roar. <laughs> Luckily, Filler Man shows up and rescues them. Quick catch up with Patrick, he discovers that the squad that captured him is run by his dad, who died 26 years ago on the mission they're doing right now. Hey, remember Gwen? She wakes up to discover that five years have passed in order to give her a daughter that she only has phone picture memories of. So Gwen's experience is interesting to me. She's the only one whose fantasy took her away from the island for a moment to go to that restaurant. Everyone else's experience let them seemingly stay on the island. 
But now Gwen's back on the island with this new family of hers, and the husband's not like, hey, what are we doing here? Weren't we just in the city a second ago? Now, I know he's not real, and I know this probably doesn't matter. I just think it would have been cooler if they let everybody's fantasy weirdly take them away from the island for just a moment. The restaurant was jarring to see, and I think they could have played around with the idea more. So Rourke has a heart-to-heart with Gwen, and we learn that he and his wife were looking for this island because of the power it has. But his wife died before they found it. So now, he uses the island's power to bring his wife back as long as he stays on the island and does its bidding as the orchestrator of the guest's fantasies. Patrick informs his dad that he's going to die on this very mission. And like any normal person, his dad just wants to bail out of it then. But Patrick's like, no, you have to stay and die for your men and be a hero. It's weird because this is like the only scene where he wants that, though. You know, there's other ways that he can be a hero, right? I mean, Patrick seemingly knows the future here. He can change the course of how his dad dies, perhaps. So Gwen is feeling the same. She has a husband and a kid now, but she doesn't feel like she deserves any of it. So she goes back to Rourke and was like, I want a do-over. And he's like, uh, no. Back to the girls. They're now following their slightly confused tour guide. They discover the heart of the island, so to speak, and the source of all the power that shows you your fantasy. Your fantasy would be to get back together with your husband? Thank you, Exposition Mel. So now Mr. Filler explains who he is. He's a private investigator that came to the island to try to find the source of the power. But Mr. Rourke broke his phone, so now he's stuck here. So the island is evil. It wants to grant your fantasies, but at the same time, turn it around on its user. That's what we're led to believe so far. Let's move on. P.I. Man takes some water from the power source to smuggle off the island. Gwen finds Julia just coughing up a storm. Boy, she's really coming down with that horrible whatever she's got. Gwen says she wanted a do-over, but chose the wrong moment. And now we learn the story of Blackened Chicken. Remember him? He lived next to Gwen in an apartment building that she accidentally set on fire. This is why she feels guilty all the time. She doesn't feel like she deserves anything because she did this. So she goes back to Mr. Rourke and loopholes him in the face. It's not a new fantasy. It's the same fantasy done right. And she gets a do-over. Once again, she's transported into that burning apartment building where we discover JD, Brax, and Patrick were all on the scene that night not helping. Huh. Black and Chicken's name is Nick, by the way. Movie moves quick between the characters, so keep up! The girls get a life lesson from Filler Man right before Lurch shows up and stabs him in his juicy shoulder. So he tackles the man right off the cliff and it's funny to me every time. Things are starting to merge together as the army guys show up to the party house for some reason. They fight the armed men terrorizing our brothers. Remember their brothers? And my brother, he's Asian. Brotherly brothers. My brother and I. Bro, 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 you're broke. That's me, I'm his brother. Wait. Oh, by the way, JD gets shot and dies. The group bails after they realize that nothing can kill these armed men, but doesn't that also mean the army guys are immortal too? The girls end up back in the dang torture room because they know that they can access a phone to the outside from there. And Sloane ends up giving the speech about friendship or love or something to her cheated on boyfriend and Melanie at the same time and ends up calling them a plane to come pick him up. Back in the burning apartment building, Gwen is pulled out of the oven by Julia. But her plan failed. She didn't save Nick. She has this epiphany that this is somebody else's fantasy. Somebody who doesn't want her to succeed and wants to torment them all. Interesting. Melanie was the only person who wasn't in the burning apartment complex, and she says, Oh, well, I was supposed to have a date with Nick that night, but I bailed on him, so he wasn't supposed to be home. And my roommate both looked at each other and said, Well, that's a stretch. There's a reason why. The plane shows up, by the way, and gets blown right out of the sky. But not before some more duh plane callbacks. Back on the run, the group goes, and they try to figure out what's going on. Melanie says that Julia could be Nick's mom, and it's her fantasy to get revenge. 
That would be interesting if we didn't already know that Julia was Rourke's wife. It's pretty obvious. Melanie then suggests that they find the source of the island's power and blow it up. So into the whining caves they go, where they all get separated because this group is like herding cats. Everyone runs into some nightmare vision that slows them down a bit. Just see snakes. Oh, looks like those sea snakes just turned into sea men, am I right? High five. Oh. An epic twist you don't want to miss. Guys, it's Melanie! She obsessed over Nick and wants revenge for his death, but... Why was she scared this whole time, even when she was alone? Why did she think Sloane was a hologram the first time she saw her? Is the island really evil, or is it just because of her evil revenge fantasy? They said other people died here. Were those revenge fantasies too? Why did all these people get fantasies? What absurd contest got them all here? Who is advertising Death Islands online? So Mr. Filler had grabbed some of the water from the island's power source and now Sloane's carrying it around. If she drinks it, she gets one of the fantasies because she hasn't had one play out yet. She makes it quick. She wants Melanie and Nick to be together and it results in his blackened chicken self pulling her body into the depths with him. That seems to conflict with Melanie's fantasy's conclusion, but whatever. Now that could have been a perfectly fine ending, but nope. Melanie tosses a grenade on the ground just for good measure right before she dies, and Patrick has to dive onto it just like his dad did to save everybody else. Boy, that was forced. Hey, you know what? Only one person has died in this horror movie so far. Really? Oh, that's not good. Well, that's cool. Just throw a grenade at one of the other ones. It'll be fine. One star in Yelp. Once a Karen, always a Karen. So Sloane asks what's gonna stop them all from suing the living daylights out of this island, and Rourke responds by saying fantasies are like dreams. You rarely remember the details, but you always remember how they made you feel. That doesn't answer her question, though. Are they not gonna remember this after they leave? There will always be this patch of weird fear in their minds that they don't remember what it came from, from this weekend. How are other people talking about this island if they don't remember it after they leave? Brax tells Rourke that he just wants his brother to stay alive and go home. And Rourke says, yeah, that's doable, but you have to stay on this island with me. Do you see where this is going? But he needs like a nickname, right? Brax is too weird. What was that nickname that JD called him that pissed him off so much? It's Tattoo. Brax's Tattoo. So, I don't know how accurately this portrayed the TV show. When I saw the trailer, I was hoping for more of like a Wishmaster thing, but what I got was this. Turning wishes and dreams on their head is kind of a cool concept for horror movies to me. This just didn't deliver. It left a lot of questions unanswered, and a lot of plot holes, and the twist? Guys, not every movie needs a twist. Calm down. So that was Fantasy Island. Did it deserve an 8% on Rotten Tomatoes? I've seen worse. I, it sounds to me like the theatrical version was super lame, though. A lot of cutaways and, and things chopped out to make it PG-13 for the children. Stop doing that. Just make it rated R. But I was let down for sure here, and I'm kind of bummed out. I think the only thing that can lift my spirits now is a Mystery Crate unboxing. Alright guys, it's that time of the video where I go off script to do an unboxing. I guess I'm a real YouTuber now. Mm. Can you believe there's channels that just do this all the time? What a nightmare. Loot Crate has graciously sponsored this video. That's right, the Loot Crate we all know and love. They're back! and they have more diverse options than ever. They asked me what I wanted from a huge list of their new, very specific crates, and I kind of gave them a few options and told them I trust you, and they absolutely delivered by sending me the loot. Fright. Got a Halloween 2 t-shirt. Got a Leatherface Madballs. 
There we go. It's a... It's a Mad Balls. The Leatherface's creepy, creepy head. I got a Lovecraftian tote. What is this little box? It says on the back, Baba Yaga. Deep in the swamp dwells a fearsome crone in a hut on chicken legs. She's known to help the lost souls who stumble upon her, just as she's been known to eat them alive. In your travels, be careful not to cross paths with the Baba Yaga, a supernatural witch of Slavic folklore. Look at that. It's a little Baba Yaga. They still give you these neat little loot pins. So this month's Fright Crate has this pin. And it unlocks exclusive DLC from Crypt TV. Whoa, I'm actually I'm actually super excited about this. I believe it's just a notebook. Oh yeah, it's a journal. We got a journal themed for the Overlook Hotel. Very cool. And right on the inside. All right, here's this loot. Sorry, the wrapping loud. This loot crate came with a friend for Tiny Frank. He's so upset! Ugh. We got here, just a bite phone stand. It is a straight up loot fright product. It's a phone stand. Phone stand. Last but not least, I've got an Evil Dead 2 Super Emo Friends Adult Collectible. Not a toy. So here we go. Here are the components. Okay. A little model of Ash being attacked. Look at that. So that's the whole crate. I think that's tons of items for the price you get. Again, you can get a discount with the code in the description, rabbit15. I also have a link, so just click the link, use the code, and you're good to go for some cool loot crate stuff. <laughs> Thanks for watching, guys. See you next time.